All right, everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Atlanta Real Estate Investor Podcast. And I am your host, Spencer Sutton. Now, usually I have Matthew Whitaker with me, but he is not able to be here. So I'm going to take this solo, but I'm excited uh, today because I've got a guest here. His name is Kevin Polite with Housewife Homes. Is that right? Did I get that right, Kevin? That's correct. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right, good. So, and, and I was just telling Kevin earlier, I, like, I think this is going to be a, a great interview because um, our last episode, we interviewed, uh, you know, big institutional buyer and with John, and then now we're coming to Kevin and Kevin is more of a, he's not a big institution. He represents like a vast majority of investors out there. They're building their portfolio. They're building, they're buying 10 and 20 and 30 properties. They have a goal. Maybe they're flipping some houses. And so Kevin, welcome to the show. I'm excited to, to dive in with you. Hey Spencer. I'm glad to be here. I'm looking forward to it also. All right. Well, good. Well, let's just kick off. I mean, I love stories and I just kind of like to hear people's background. So I'd love to, for you to tell us how you got started in real estate and then maybe uh, tell us about your first deal. Sure. I, um, it kind of was based on my um, longest W2. I was working at the uh, Atlanta Journal and Constitution, the main newspaper here in Atlanta in the last um, couple of years that I was there, I was uh, the real estate advertising manager. So uh, part of my duties was kind of to be the liaison between our reps and the real estate community. And so a lot of my reps had um, like the largest um, real estate agencies, the largest builders, um, condos that started booming here. Um, so I worked a lot with them and I, uh, you know, being around them all the time and, and seeing what they do uh, was part of my job to better understand their needs to help us sell more advertising to them. So that's right. kind of piqued my interest there. And then, uh, well, we all know what happened to the newspaper industry. Mm, uh, yeah. And I kind of foresaw that coming. So I started um, buying and selling back then. And um, I think it was 2008 that they laid off pretty much 80% of their staff. And I took a package and actually used some of that money to buy my first property. <laughs> Did you really? Um, oh, and great. so, um, I mean, I continued working for a couple of years, but during that time I uh, started buying and selling. And it was uh, one of the emphasis of me starting was that um, there was a, a, a house on my street where an investor had bought it and this was during the downturn. So you could, at that time you could still get them pretty cheap. And then I saw the job they had done and I had just remodeled my own home. I mean, we had hired a GC and everything, but we were basically in control of telling them what we wanted, where do we want to do, picking the architecture and all that um, uh, architect rather. And so after I saw the job they had done and then the job that I had done on my house, I was like, well, I think I can do that. So. <laughs> <laughs> you think you really think I can do that to a different house and, and flip yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. Awesome. So we ended up buying a house two doors down from that. And at the same time, in another neighborhood, uh, we bought a, a buy and hold there. And um, so we, we when we finished the buy and hold, um, initially we were going to sell it. And that neighborhood reminded me of where I live now, which is, what we used to call an up and coming neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, and it was, we bought because it was close to town. You could get into work uh, real quick, uh, but we saw how the neighborhood was changing. And that neighborhood that we bought in first reminded us of um, our neighborhood, um, you know, 10 years before. So, yeah. um, but you know, that that's how I started. I mean, I just, I was in that field before and got a lot of interest in it. Talked to a lot of people. So I had contacts and, you know, someone that I could always, folks that I could always call back and, and ask questions with. So that, that's basically how I got my start. So let me ask you this. Do you think you would have like gotten serious about it and started buying and selling had the uh, Atlanta journal constitution started downsizing and you were like, Hey, I see the writing on the wall. Um, or would you have just kind of remained in your, in your uh, kind of in your role with, uh, with that company? Um, well, hindsight's twenty twenty, but um at that time, you know, the, the real newspapers were booming. And yeah. I mean, we didn't, the internet had just come out and it was funny. I were, was thinking uh, my director at the time was saying, 
uh, you know, 10 years from now that no one will be using newspapers. They'll, um, they won't be using print. They'll all be, um, buying their ads online. And we're like, Oh, that's just crazy. You know, but uh, <laughs> that'll never happen. No, no. But, right. <laughs> but we had lifetimers there that were there for 30 and 40 years. So I saw myself retiring there. But when yeah. I saw the internet coming, I learned as much as I could about internet advertising. And it's funny, my next two jobs after that, before I went full time with real estate were in internet advertising. So I kind of saw the, the things coming, but uh, probably would have still been there. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I get it. Um, it's really interesting how different events in life will change your direction and give you kind of new vision for different things. So I, th- I think that story is really interesting. Um, you know, I was reading your bio, doing some research, Kevin, and what I found out was that you are hyper focused um, in certain areas uh, in Atlanta. And so you know, we always talk about when we're talking to new investors about, you know, they're always asking, hey, where should I buy? We, we're just, you know, very transparent and say, listen, you need to really focus probably on one area and like get to know it very, very, very well. And so talk to us about why you chose uh, kind of focused in Decatur. And I, I saw some zip codes listed in your bio. So tell me a little bit about that and what your strategy is there. Yeah, sure. I, I remember asking one of the best things I've heard was um, when someone asked you a question about real estate, the best answer is depends, you know? So <laughs> when folks ask me, where should I, def- I start it, you know, I always say what well, depends on, you know, how much knowledge you have now, how much capital do you have? How much do you know about real estate? And one of the, the things that um, I always try to do is stick with what you know, keep it yeah. simple, you know, the yep. KISS rule. And yep. I was familiar with this area and I saw how it was growing. Um, and one of the other things I wanted to do was more than just get an investment. I wanted to make a change in the neighborhood. Mm-hmm. Um, so one of the areas that we started grow, uh, growing in was Decatur uh, 30032, which ironically was the most flipped uh, zip code in the United States back in 2017, 2018. Wow. Um, but we started um, investing there in uh, 2011. And I wanted to buy, I figured if I could buy a number of houses in that neighborhood, I could buy a couple to flip and then also buy, buy and hose. And the flipping would help my rentals uh, mm-hmm. become a more secure neighborhood and thus increase the rents. And um, plus, I was familiar with that. We mostly get 1950s, uh, 60s brick ranches, the kind of the mid-century brick ranch style. And that was something I was familiar with. And a lot of the homes I can walk in and close my eyes, um, you know, before we buy them. And I can tell you where the bathroom is, where the bedroom is, what I'm going to do. I'm going to take out this wall here. So um, that was the emphasis of that was just we wanted to go in and also make a, obviously make a profit, but also make a difference. And we got involved. uh, One of the neighborhoods I'm in, uh, Middlebrook Acres, we got involved with the neighborhood because I always made sure the neighbors know who I was, which Mm -hmm. helps like during that time, you know, there were people were still still in uh, HVACs for the copper. Right. We, none of our houses ever got vandalized because we made sure we knew uh, all the neighbors and the neighbors knew us. So they kind of looked out for us. I remember, you know, getting a call at uh, 12 o'clock in the morning saying, uh, Kevin, someone's at your house. And it turned out there was our HVAC guy who liked to work at night in the middle of a, <laughs> he uh, wasn't stealing, he was summer, installing. But, yeah. <laughs> but I thought that was cool because you know, that someone was looking out for uh, us. That is awesome. No, that is, that is, that is great. And I'm really interested. I mean, this is a great strategy for anybody listening because what Kevin's saying is, Hey, I would buy a property to, flip it, do a great rehab and flip it to increase the property values. And at the same time, I'm buying and holding rentals in the area. So tell me what's the difference? Like, how do you decide what's going to be your flip and what's going to be uh, something that you put in your rental portfolio? Uh, It just depends on the cost of the acquisition and, um, and the market at that time, you know, Um, one of the last houses that we bought there was, um, I was fixing a house to do a flip on, uh, but I depend, you know, I, I, I'm very conservative, so I don't grow real fast um, mm-hmm. because I want to make sure we have the amount, right amount of reserves. We have the, 
the funds for CapEx, you never know when an HVAC will go out of, um, you know, or something like that. Right. But we were working on a house on, on this one block and two houses over a tree fell on the back of a house, um, a couple of houses down. And the neighbor saw the sign that I had in the yard and came over and said, Hey, can you tell us how much it would cost to fix up this house? And I was honest with her. I was telling her, you know, the different scenarios and everything. And then she turned around and said, well, do you want to buy it? And I was like, <laughs> yeah, sure. Yes. hundred <laughs> percent. That, that being involved in the neighborhood uh, kind of yeah. helped me pick up another deal. Yeah. No, I think that's great. And that's a, that's a great um, lesson to learn for yeah. anybody who's local in Atlanta and starting to build their portfolio. I mean, getting to know the neighbors, getting to know the neighborhoods, um, you're going to pick up deals like that. It's just really amazing how that happens over the course oh, yeah. of time. It, yeah. And, and going back to, to, uh, to that, I, I wanted another buy and hold. And so the house that we were working on at the time, instead of flipping it, mm -hmm. um, I ended up keeping that property as a rental and it's now my highest uh, rental rate. And then the house where the neighbor called and asked, did I want to buy it? Uh, that allowed me to have a, to keep the other rental and then keep this house, which was actually in a better, the design of it was better for a flip. So I was able to do both on that same block. Okay. So you said the design was better for a flip. What does that, what does that mean? Uh, well, it, this one had a little more square footage. Mm -hmm. uh, it had actually, the tree had fallen down on a, a extension that they had done in the back. So right. we already had the foundation there. Um, and, you know, the, the bigger the square footage, the more, uh, you know, final price point you're going to get. Yep. So we figured we could get more. And uh, at the price we were getting at, as well made a difference from us having a higher profit margin on that than the other house we would have kept. And then by allowing us to, to keep that other house, there were a couple of more houses that were flipped on the block. So now, you know, we've got a um, if we were if, because it's still um, cash flowing pretty well, uh, we're going to keep that house. Yep. Well, that's great. I mean, I, I think that's a great story. So let me let me ask you this, um, Kevin. I learned a lot. Like, so when I started real estate investing, it was two thousand and three. And I can just tell you, I have made a lot of mistakes, especially early on in my career. So, I mean, ha have you learned from any kind of mistakes? What kind of mistakes have you made that maybe you could warn our listeners about? Like, man, I wish I would have, I wish I would have known this, or I wish I would have done this differently kind of as you started your career. Oh yeah. And not to say I still don't make mistakes today, but <laughs> yeah, no, I, I still do too. <laughs> but the, the first house we bought, um, we were paying the contractor by the hour, which is mm -hmm. the worst thing that you can ever do. But I did at the time I didn't know. And, um, uh, we were getting to the point where this seems to be taking a little bit longer than it should. And then, um, at that time, I hadn't started reaching out to, to as many investors. I knew real estate on the retail side, but yeah. obviously when you're flipping, it's a whole different story. So I started going to like um, real estate investment groups. I started reading like bigger pockets, started re listening to podcasts like, you know, yours. And uh, that's someone told me that's probably the worst thing you can do is pay them by the hour. And <laughs> once we learned that, we kind of yeah. stopped and said, OK, here's the rest of our budget. If you can do it in this amount of time um, right. and at that up for this price, um, then we can go forward. But, that you know, that was one of the best things that I learned was, you know, how, how to work with contractors. And it, also at that same time, one of the best ways I found to find a new contractor was I would go around to job sites. Yep. And if I saw someone doing a good, good job, I would get, you know, I'd ask for, you know, who's in charge there. And that's how I found some of my best contractors. Yeah. And that is, that is so true. I mean, contractors can, can make or break um, your deals, especially when you're doing flips like this. So vitally important to get that right. And, uh, and you know, I, I think, you know, you mentioned going to real estate investor meetings and, and all those types of things, getting on bigger pockets, educating yourself. So how important is it to kind of get involved in the real estate community when you're starting out and, and starting to, to get um, to do this full time? Well, one of the number one things is, you know, making contacts, um, you know, um, and that I, 
actually I bought my last deal um, from off market from a guy that I knew from one of the, um, the Georgia um, uh, association of real estate investors. Uh, Just we, he knew he invested in that same area, but he's at that point where he's getting ready to retire, uh, moved to Hilton head and he's slowly getting rid of some of his portfolio. And he knew I liked those type of houses and that, that yeah. particular area. So he just called me up, you know, called me up and said, Hey, Kevin, I got a house to sell. You know, we negotiated. Uh, and that's how I bought my last deal. So networking is one of the most important things. You know, you can find your contractors, you can find your subcontractors. Yeah. Um, it's also a good way of finding out what's going on in the market. You know, West Atlanta uh, is real hot right now. Um, and I'm not necessarily investing over there, but it's always good to go to these meetings find out what other people are doing, what are they seeing in the market, you know, who knows with, uh, you know, COVID, um, where the market is headed, but it's always nice right. to talk to people that, are, you know, have boots on the ground and see what they're doing and how it's affecting them. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's a great, great point. Like having people that you can trust and it really amazes me how generous the real estate investing community is like really when you get to know each other and you can tell that, Hey, people just, they're, they're willing to help people. And the, and the people who have been doing it the most realize that, Hey, there are plenty of deals to go around. Even in this competitive market, there's still enough deals for people, people to have. And so oh, yeah. I think, I think that's, that's great. Definitely. And like, if something comes up that, you know, you're not familiar with, like I had a, I did my first new construction last year and um, there was an item that came up that in all my, I mean, all my um, research and, you know, getting my bids and everything, the County had come up with a new, um, I, a new plan where they had to, because of the sewer system, we had to put in an infiltration system and I didn't know none of my plumbers did it. Uh, But, you know, after making a few calls, um, you know, one of the other investors told me, Hey, this is the guy to call. And, you know, gave me the number and the guy was out there the next day and, you know, we were able to do that. But had I not known that, I would have been searching around, finding someone to do that. And, you know, I couldn't complete the deal. You know, I couldn't complete the house without having that to get my final permit. So speaking about the real estate community and how generous everybody is, talk to me about who has been most influential or who's inspired you the most um, through this kind of real estate journey that you've been taking. Uh, One of the the person that inspired me was, uh, Michelle Valachek, our, uh, the broker of the uh, real estate agency that I'm involved in. Um, and she started their agency because she was actually a real estate investor before she was an agent. Um, and she couldn't find a real estate agency that would allow her to carry her, her portfolio with her. Uh, Cause when you're an agent, you know, you have different rules and regulations and she right. couldn't find a good fit for her uh, portfolio, because I think she had a hundred or so at the time. And she said, well, I'll just start my own brokerage, you know? So now (laughs) she's like one of the 10 largest uh, brokerages in Atlanta area. Um, But she allows us to be, if you want to be a part-time agent, if you want to be an investor agent, a lot of the larger um, real estate companies won't allow you to do that. But being with them was, is great because it allows you to, um, you know, be an agent and have a portfolio and you don't have to um, worry about, you know, following the rules and regula- regulations that, that are legal, but they just don't allow that because it's not, doesn't fit their, their uh, business strategy. Yeah. Which is great for you because you're also a realtor, but you don't really, I mean, you will, you will represent people absolutely, but you're, you're doing it mostly for your own flips and for your own portfolio. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I think it's good to have a different sources of um, income. Um, Yeah. And one of the things if it taught me when, you know, when I was laid off from the newspaper after, you know, 20 plus years is that you can't rely on just one thing. So, you know, I have the real estate agency business, um, which allows me, you know, to buy and sell my own deals. But at the same time, um, I still do, you know, several deals a year um, as another source of income. And then, um, the flipping part, um, allows me, you know, the profits from that as well as the buy and hold. So, you know, some people say, well, what what do you, you know, should I be doing buy and hold or should I do flips? And I think it's beneficial to do both because depending on how the market is, it may be better to, to buy buy and holds or, you know, like right now, if you can find a good deal, 
uh, in the Atlanta market, houses are selling like it, it, you know, you should, if it's not selling in less than 30 days, then you've got it priced wrong. Yeah. You got a price wrong or you got a dog of a house. Yeah. <laughs> there's, there's something <laughs> wrong with the house. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And we, we talk about that too, with rentals. Like we say, Hey, the three things that really matter most because people want to know all the time from us, how quickly can you rent my property? We say, Hey, price, as long as you have market price. And then we say the product. So the house needs to be in good shape, needs to be a good house, can't be super funky. And then obviously seasonality will kind of depend a little bit, but I mean, here we are in January and it's, it's been a hot market, uh, all throughout the holidays and, and, uh, doesn't look like it's slowing down anytime soon. Oh yeah. Yeah. I had a, a closing right before, you know, we were rushing to try to get it closed before Christmas day. So (laughs) (laughs) it's amazing. So talk to me just real quick. I mean, Kevin, I'd love to know your boots on the ground. Of course you focus in, in Decatur and those in that area, what, but what's happening in Atlanta? Because you mentioned, you know, one of the things that you, what made you successful, I think, in Decatur was you saw that, hey, this is an up and coming community, right? So we can see that a change is going to be happening and we want to be a part of that, A, for the community, but also, hey, this is a great way to kind of build value for ourselves and our company. What are you seeing in the Atlanta market now? Are there any other up and coming areas that, um, that people should be thinking about or, or, uh, exploring. Yeah. Well, well, one, it's funny The I saw in the, um, uh, somewhere in the news the other day that Atlanta is next year going to be the seventh largest city in the U S. And I remember when I moved here 30 something years ago, it was like in the top 15, and every day you hear an announcement of somebody moving in, another new company moving in. Yeah. So um, the two factors that you want to look at, like if you're an out-of-state investor, is is the city, is there population growth? And um, is there a new job growth to support that new population growth? And Atlanta's just hitting it out of the ballpark with that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the city as a whole is just still growing like crazy. And there's actually two markets, um, two major markets. And one is outside 285, mm-hmm. um, which is the belt, the uh, the interstate that goes around the city, and then there's right. everything inside of that. And so those are those are two totally different markets. And then you know you start to uh, separate them, uh, differentiate them down from there. Um, one of the hot markets right now, which we're not investing in, but we're starting to look for deals, is on the west and uh, the northwest side of town. There is a new um, park that's opening up it's the belt line uh that's that's going around the city of atlanta as opposed to the uh, metro area uh and it's a new bike and and walking path and maybe soon transportation and anything near the belt line is just going crazy Uh, so it's hard to find deals there but i think um the areas near uh the quarry like I always go by zip codes because back in my newspaper days, I used to do inserts. So I knew all <laughs> yeah, the zip right. codes in the city. Yeah, well, give us zip codes. That's great. <laughs> but 30314, 30318, um, or within the Northwest areas, those are close to the quarry. That's going to be the largest park within in, in, in the metropolitan area. Yeah. And so that one's booming. You've already got Microsoft is coming over there and it's rumored they're going to put like 15,000 jobs in that area. Mm. So Wow. You know, if you, it's almost too late to invest at a good price over there, but it's still, I mean, you can still find a lot of um, inventory. Uh, the other areas are the West side, which are like 30310, which is city of Atlanta. Yeah. Um, and uh, 30311, uh, 30311, which is Cascade. Those are still, those are the hot areas now, but if you can find a good deal in those areas and Decatur is still good. I mean, anything inside 285, uh, you know, it's still good. You know, you, you may have areas where you've got million dollar houses, which is like city of Decatur. Um, mm-hmm. And then I say Decatur has like five different areas. You've got the, the city of Decatur area. Then you've got the suburban part, which is further out. And then you've got the ones that are closer in to city, of, like basically adjacent to city of Decatur. And those are still good areas. There's still a lot of uh, inventory there. Um, if you can find it. <laughs> yeah. Right there. So there's good deals as long as you can find those deals. 
Right. I mean, that then that goes back to, you know, networking, yep. uh, going to the meetings, you know, finding out what's on there. And there's even I'm even finding I bought a, um, the deal that I bought after the one I bought from the investor. I bought it off of MLS, um, you know, because wow. uh, wholesalers know that there's a lot of uh, there's not much inventory uh, as far as a real good deal. So uh, the pricing that I've seen from them has almost been as high as MLS. So that last deal we bought was actually cheaper than it was on MLS. I mean, would have been going through a wholesaler. Yeah. No, I think, and I really think that's, and that's great information. I think it's really important. We talk about this all the time is understanding your buy box, like understanding what your criteria are so that whether it's on MLS or whether it's a wholesaler, as long as it fits that criteria in that buy box, you're okay to buy it. You don't have to, you know, and you're not going outside of that. You're not trying to make special exceptions. Then what may not be a good deal to somebody else could be a good deal to you just based on what your goals are. Yeah. And it goes with, I mean, if you're doing buying hoes, then you're talking, you know, uh, are you comfortable doing uh, class C properties? Right. Um, You know, or do you want to be a little safer and do class B, but not make as much? And then there's class A, which, you know, that's a whole totally different market right there. And then put those in different areas. You know what? Maybe class C in Decatur may not be the same if you go out to Marietta. So um, and and the amount of work that you're going to have to put into a property to get it to class B as opposed to class C and the types of struggles that you have with the type of tenant that you may get for class C. So those are all uh, different factors that you have to look at when you're looking at what type of buy and hold um, that you're looking for. Yeah. And the great thing about Atlanta is that you can find whatever class you want. (laughs) I mean, it is, it is, I mean, you can go a all the way to D F class, whatever the case is, you can, you can, you can find it. And that's, that's a great uh, thing about Atlanta. So what you're comfortable with. And to me, a lot of that comes down to what risk am I willing to take? You know, what kind of return do I want? And then what is the, what is the corresponding risk that I'm going to need to take to, uh, to get that? Because a lot of the stuff that I invested in early in my career, I mean, I bought a 10 house package for a hundred thousand dollars. It was uh, class D houses, but I was willing to take that risk at that point in, in time. Now I'm, uh, I'm a good bit different than that now, but you live and you learn. So, um, you know, talk, talk just real quickly. I think this is, you know, just what we're hitting on here. We talk uh, to investors um, a lot about, especially new investors that call us asking about certain areas of town. We talk to them a lot about um, first having their goals, like what is your ultimate goal and what you're doing, having a plan, how to get there. And now that may not have been the way you started your company, but kind of looking forward, what is, uh, what's the ultimate goal um, for you and your company over the next 10 years? That's a good question. Um, because when we started, we didn't have a goal. We were just like, well, let's, <laughs> That's right. do, let's, let's do happens. these two houses. Let's get these <laughs> sold, get some cash flow. Yeah. And then once we started, you know, I started doing it a little bit more Then you, you want to get organized, you know, you get your team together. Like I have a great accountant um, mm-hmm. that I work with. Um, I have a financial planner that I, I, I go to once every two years. And um, but you, but in getting to that, what your goal is, you have to go back and look at where you are. You know, mm-hmm. what are your strengths and weaknesses? And then again, what are you comfortable with? Um, and after doing that, you know, a lot of people look at, okay, what do I want to do when I retire? And then yeah. you base your goals on that and then you grow your company that way. But, you know, since I left my W2 five years ago, um, coming up, um, I like what I'm doing. You know, yeah. I don't necessarily see yeah. myself ever retiring. So we want to continue. I think we're happy with the number of doors we have. Yeah. As far as buy and hold. Um, and we want to continue paying those down. Um, cause we, I mean, we're not heavily in debt, which is one of the great things. And that's another strategy you can look at, you know, right. you can go, you know, high debt and get more doors or you can get lower debt and get more cash flow. And we went the, the less doors, higher cash flow. Um, right. so when we do our flips, we're always comfortable because you want to make sure you have different exit strategies. You know, if I have a, um, 
a flip that doesn't go well, you know, we have the reserves that we can keep it for a year or two uh, until the mark, you know, until we hit that price point that we want to get. Um, so our goal is just to continue doing um, buying hose. We want to find we're we've got a couple of pieces of land. Uh, we did new construction last year, which went really well. I mean, we had one of them sold um, right when uh, COVID started. Um, we put that on the market. Like, I mean, I think it was two or three days after, you know, they announced all the clothes down. <laughs> right. And uh, we and had no traffic that. Yeah, we had no traffic that first week. And then I think once people started putting processes and protocols in place, um, I mean, we had like a ton of traffic and then had it under contract in a week. And then the wow. other new construction, we had it under contract before we had even, um, you know, we had, we were still framing it and we hadn't really put it on the market. We just put a sign out front. Um, so yeah, we're going to continue to to look for land, uh, to do new construction. We're going to continue, uh, we want to double the number of flips we're doing right now. And if we run across a deal where it's another buy and hold and it makes yeah. sense, um, then, you know, we'll, we'll throw that in there as well. I think that's great. I mean, you've got a, a to me, a, somewhat of a conservative plan, but I like that. I mean, that is, you know, the ups and downs of high leverage and all of that just will, can, can really uh, make you create scenarios where you're making decisions that aren't wise over time. And um, we, we had a, we had a, a guest on the show, Michael Zuber, and he's the author of a book called One Rental at a Time. And he just talks about that. He was like, you know, for uh, for me, for he and his wife, it was just one rental at a time. And they just built and built. And it was over 15 years. And then he eventually he kind of changed his strategy and started doing multifamily. And, you know, so I like that approach. Have you ever thought about now what's becoming very popular in the market now is uh, build to rent? So, you know, you're talking about new construction have you ever thought about like buying land and doing build to rent or are you really looking at, Hey, we're going to build to sell like retail. Yeah. I've looked at that. It's actually, there is a uh, subdivision down in South Atlanta. Uh, I want to say Stockbridge or somewhere around in there where a builder was building a 50 unit um, subdivision mm -hmm. um, and sold like five homes and for whatever reason decided Hey, this works better as a rental, and so now they're gonna. It's turning it into a rental property, but a lot yeah. of new people are doing construction. The first um, um, new construction that I did was actually across the street from one of my rentals, and the um, my initial thought was to buy that and and keep that property as a rental, um, but the market kept. I mean, the price that we got for it, we couldn't turn it down and we needed that sure. additional capital. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I can see doing that. It's just where we invest right now, the cost of land prohibits, yeah, pretty much prohibits right. that. Yep. Yeah. You got to maybe look in the, uh, beyond out in the outer skirts as things kind of start sprawling, continue in Atlanta to sprawl outwards, especially with people working from home possibly moving out of the city and moving to uh, other homes, you know, larger homes out outside the city. So, Hey, listen, Kevin, this has been great. I've really enjoyed our, uh, our time together. Uh, and, you know, we talked before we even started the show, just like, Hey, what if people have questions? Do you want people contacting you? So, and you were totally up for that because you love to make connections in the real estate world. So why don't you tell people, our listeners, where they can connect with you or how they can connect with you? Oh, a couple of different ways. Um, I mean, you can connect. The easiest way is to get to my web, uh, our Housewai Homes uh, webpage. But if you go to kevinpolite.com, that will also take you there. It's much easier to spell. Uh, <laughs> we didn't think of that when we started branding initially. Right, that's no, okay. Uh, but uh, you can contact me that way. And then uh, my email address is kevin at com, which is uh, H A U S Z W E I H O M E S dot com. Awesome. Well, Kevin, thanks for being a guest. And everybody, listen, if you haven't already subscribed, do it. Uh, share it with your friends. 
Uh, this has been a great episode. I hope you got some nuggets out of it. And if you found any of the content, any of our podcasts helpful, beneficial, make sure you uh, go on iTunes and leave us a five-star review. It helps other people find us. And so that's it. We will see you on another episode of the Atlanta Real Estate Investor in two weeks.